um, geriatric interest group. And today is our um, annual or second annual um, student medical student half day. Um, I, my name is Patrick and I'm the conference chair for this year. And right over um, outside, um, we should probably met is um, Catherine Chang. She is the NGIG president for this year. And I'm very happy to introduce our guest, first guest for today is Dr. Mary Tinetti. Um, she is the Gladys Phillips Crawford um, Professor of Medicine and Epidemiology at the Yale School of Medicine and the Chief of the Section of Geriatrics. She was the investigator to first identify that older adults at risk for falling and injury could be identified and that falls and injuries were associated with a range of serious adverse outcomes and that multifactorial risk reduction strategies were effective and cost effective. She is involved in efforts to translate these research findings into clinical and public health practice. Her current research focus is on clinical decision making for older adults in the face of multiple health conditions, as what you've probably gathered from the earlier talk, particularly trade-offs among health conditions and the harm and benefits of commonly recommended treatments. She has investigated the use of cross-disease universal outcomes, including patient-reported outcomes, to assess the benefits and harms of treatment for older adults with multiple chronic conditions. She has over 150 original peer-reviewed publications, as well as several reviews and book chapters. Dr. Tinetti received her undergraduate and medical degrees from the University of Michigan and completed a geriatric and clinical epidemiology fellowship at the University of Rochester, following an internal medicine residency at the University of Minnesota. She's also the recipient of um, a prestigious award, a fellowship from MacArthur Foundation. And in addition to her research, Dr. Tinetti provides care to older adults at Yale New Haven Hospital. So can we just give a round of applause for Dr. Tinetti for sharing her expertise and time with us today. So this is really an informal session that where we can just ask um, Dr. Tinetti questions about be it more professionally or kind of like more life goals and that kind of stuff. So maybe I can just um, start off with a question. Um, how did you find geriatrics and how was the development of the Tinetti balance test like? So to, to answer your first question, um, I was not lucky to, uh, to go to medical school at a time when there was geriatrics. Uh, it was really a field that that was just just beginning and it was really not a part of mainstream medicine at that time. So I didn't really get know what geriatrics was or interested with it until I was uh, a uh, medical resident, internal medicine resident at the University of Minnesota. And what got me tweaked by it and interested in it was that I saw a lot of patients with chronic diseases and again, very similar to what I talked about across the hall. We were learning how to diagnose their heart failure and learning how to do a lot of uh, tests and get numbers and treat numbers. But I would see over and over again that people's numbers, their ejection fraction, for those of you who, who've already done um, cardiac physiology, you know, ejection fractions would get better or their hemoglobin A1C would get better. But they didn't seem any happier. They didn't sort of seem like we were addressing the issues that were most important to them. Um, and. Uh, so I looked around to see what would be a specialty, what would be an area of medicine where I could focus on the issues that patients were dealing with in their daily lives, and that new field was, um, was geriatrics. So that's really how I got, got interested in it. And how did you develop, how okay. to develop the test? Oh, so this is a, a, um, a um, you know, first of all, be careful what you do because you don't know what's going to have legs, if you will. And so the, uh, the, the, probably the thing I am most, most known for is the Tinetti Balance and Gait Scale. And uh, let me tell you how it was developed. And I, I'm, I'm amazed that it has lasted as long as it has. So when I uh, finished my residency and went to do my geriatric fellowship at the University of Rochester, um, the, the, um, and I'm sure you're already finding that role models in your life are going to have a very big influence on uh, what, what you do. And my role model was Dr. Franklin Williams, and he was the head of geriatrics at the University of Rochester. And he was the person who said, falling is something that really happens to a lot of older people, and it's really been neglected. 
and we just assumed that it was just something that happens to people. And he was convinced that it really was a health condition, that if we looked at it carefully, we would uh, figure out how to uh, prevent it and, and therefore avoid the uh, functional loss and hip fractures and pain that people experience when they fall. So he convinced me that that was an area that I should investigate. Um, and so when I started to investigate it, and this was sort of a, a lot of science really is kind of, duh, why, why didn't we know this? And obviously, when do people fall, right? They fall when they walk, duh, right? Um, and so I said, well, okay, good. Well, I need to really include an observation of how people walk, right? How could I look at this problem of falling if we don't measure how people walk? So I figured I could go to the library and find a nice measure that showed how people walk. But that wasn't meant to be. I could find a lot of platforms, and in fact, a lot of the evaluation of how people walk was developed by NASA uh, the Nash, uh, when, uh, when we start, first started the, the space program in the United States. And what happened, right? These, you couldn't find a more buff group of people, right? But they would get off their spaceships and they'd fall down. Um, and so, so they had to, so you couldn't just watch them, right? You had to come up with fancy machinery because this is the United States and this is NASA. <laughs> so they developed all these fancy platforms to just show how people walked and, and what, you know, they actually did figure out why people fell when they, when they got off their spaceships. But there wasn't anything that we could use in clinical practice. So I decided, all right, let's come up with a measure that we can use in our research. And this is where you guys come in. So um, Dr. Franklin William was a, Williams was a very charismatic uh, person, and he was so charismatic that he got first and second and third and fourth year medical students to come on Saturday morning. But not just one Saturday morning like you guys are doing. Every Saturday morning, they would come to his chronic disease hospital and round with him. So I got about four or five of them, and what we did um, after we were done with his rounds, we went to one of the local malls, and we sat around tables just like you guys are doing, and I said, okay, let's just watch people move around and write down what you're seeing, what you're observing. So we did this for about three or four weeks. We did young people, we did children, we did adults, we did older people. And then, there, and none of us had any expertise, right, except for our two eyes. And so basically, there was the six of us sat down after we had these observations, and we wrote down the things that we thought were important in terms of what we were observing. And what we found was amazingly, all of us untrained eyes were looking at the same things. So looking how people look like when they first stood up, you know, how they take one step after the other. What would happen if it looked like somebody was pushing them, kind of what we call the perturbations. What their arms did in relation to their trunk. And it was those observations that led to the measures that we uh, eventually uh, developed. So, so it was a group of medical students and I. And so we used it in our first study, but I think what happened was it happened at a time when people were really hungry for that information. And so there wasn't really, there wasn't another measure out there. So it really actually uh, took off and now it's used throughout the world. And, and one, of the, one of the really cool things is when, when it gets translated into another language, very often people will send me a copy of it. So I have copies in, with all beautiful Chinese figures and in uh, Turkish and it, and it, so, but that was its origin. So see what you guys do on your Saturday mornings. <laughs> <laughs> So any question from the crowd? Yeah, go ahead. Hi, my name is Maria. I'm from Queen's University. I'm a second year student. Um, so one of the themes that came up from your talk this morning um, and comes up a lot in geriatrics is the theme of complexity. Um, and I'm finding in, in our curriculum that because we're a block-based system, oftentimes we are very focused on organ systems and, and we're presented with a case and we're in our psychiatry block and I'm like, oh, I know what the answer is. It must be a psych problem. So I'm wondering what, um, 
what your thoughts are on, on geriatrics and medical education. What's the best way to yeah. approach complexity? Um, I, I think that's an excellent question. And um, I think the way we do medical uh, education really does a disservice to the students, to your future thing, and uh, to our patients. And uh, I think people are re finally recognizing that. Um, on the one hand, you need to kind of break things down, right, into simplistic box so you can understand them. But what happens is it never gets really put back together again. And so actually what, because um, I don't think it's an issue of geriatrics, because it's not really just an issue of older people, right? I mean, uh, you take younger people, and um, yes, the, you know, you may have a child, take a child with cystic fibrosis. I mean, talk about complexity, right? Or, or all the genetic anomalies and developmental delays. Um, so it's an issue across the lifespan. And so I think what we need to do is, is kind of rather than start with all the building blocks and then try to put it together is the exact opposite. Start with the human being and all of its complexities and get those observations and then figure out how to break them down into the building blocks for decision making. And I think there is a big push towards doing that more in, uh, in medical education. And the big driver of it probably is time because there's just so much knowledge and there's so much information that this block approach, there's just not enough time. The blocks are getting, there's getting to be too many blocks and too much uh, sort of thing. So I think that's being a little bit of a, a push towards it. At our medical school, what we have actually started doing, we, we're just having a re curricular redesign, and I actually was able to head the um, patient, um, the patient uh, component, uh, the kind of introduction to clinical medicine approach to it, and all, also how they learn patient care, so the patient care module. And so, so it was terrific. I mean, so, so it, the uh, committee had surgeons, pediatricians, emergency room docs, cardiologists, the full spectrum, and, we all, and, and a psychiatrist, and we all sat down together. And we thought the surgeons were gonna get right to, you know, well, you gotta come up with a decision and tell people what they need to do. The psychiatrist was gonna go into all the touchy-feely, mind and heart, right? And you know what? They all recognized the complexity was the issue. And so this multidisciplinary group sort of came out with how, what, should, what should medical curriculum look like so, so that we prepare you guys for being 21st century physicians when all of the medical issues are complex. Geriatrics is kind of like one end of the spectrum. And so we kind of de developed, so now what happens is students are gonna start by, they're gonna get a group of 10 patients of all ages that they're gonna follow they're gonna learn them as people. They're gonna know about their lives. They're gonna to go to all of their appointments with them. So before they ever learn about the Krebs cycle or pharmacology or um, you know, pulmonary function, they're gonna learn about how people's illnesses affect their daily life and how their daily life affects their patients. So they learn right from the very beginning that it's all about complexity. And so, so that's kind of a long-winded answer, but I think that's the, I think we need to turn medical curriculum completely on its side. And so a lot of the basic science will actually occur during year three and four after they've actually learned some things about patient care. I don't know how much of it's gonna, going to be implemented and how successful it's going to be, but I think it is a recognition that we have to start with the patient and work backwards to the organs rather than start with the organs. So I think that's my answer to, it's a long-winded answer, but I think that's what we need to do. Because one of the things that when we were working with our physicians in terms of this complex decision making, you know what they told us? I still think the way I did as a medical student, I make my decisions based the, on the way I was taught as a resident. So it's really important to get to you guys so you learn it right from the very beginning. Because it's hard to unlearn what, you're already kn what you already know. Thanks for that answer. Sure. Um, any questions? So I guess I can ask one. Um, in, in terms of your um, experience with patients that are in the older spectrum, can you share to us maybe some, some well, what they think are like the secrets to like aging gracefully? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, um, you know, a lot of people say, well, gosh, I really love old people. They're so wise. That's why I went into geriatrics. I really love it. You know what? The dirty secret is old people are people. And they're all different. 
every single one of them, every single person in this room is different. You've got different secrets. You've got different things that are important to you. Um, and, um, you know, I have patients who, um, you know, let's say 85-year-olds. I have patients who um, hate being old. They just really hate it. They hate, they hate not being able to see as well as they did before. They hate not being able to do as much as they did before. Um, and they think aging is cruel and horrible. And I have patients who say, I've never felt better in my life. I feel better about myself than I ever have in my life. Yes, my knee hurts. Yes, I can't run marathons like I did before. Um, yes, I'm not running a big company like I did before, but I know it's important. And, um, you know, watching the world unfold has been a great, um, you know, great thing to me. I mean, if you take 80, you know, do you take 90 year olds? I mean, they were young at a time when the automobile was introduced, when the telephone was introduced, um, uh, much less computers and whatever you guys work on now. My daughter says computers are now uh, passe. Um, so I think it's, you know, it's, it, you know, I mean, I think the, the general question, and it's not just older people, but I think younger people, one of the joys that you should have as a, as a physician is not just taking care of their conditions or their disease, but I will tell you that I think one of the major secrets that, that of, of medicine that, that, that really is not talked about is there is no other profession that, that knows more about people and are invited into the most private parts of people's lives. I mean, what a privilege. Maybe ministers come close, but they don't, you know, even they have a kind of a circumscribed. Nobody knows more and learns more and is invited into more parts of people's lives. And that's whether it's a teenager dealing with all the angst that teenagers deal with or a 90-year-old who's seen life change like nobody else has. And I think that's one of the true privileges. And it's a privilege, and it's an amazing responsibility that you will have, because people will tell you things they don't tell their spouses, they don't tell anybody. And that's, I think, the, to me, if I had to say that there's a secret, not just of geriatrics, but of medicine, regardless of what you guys go into, it's, it's the most amazing part of, of medicine. And get to know your patients as people. If there's any advice, get to know them as people. That's, it's, not, it's not just that you're helping them. It's, it's the most rewarding thing of, 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 that you will do in your career. Yeah. As our population ages, there's going to be all the baby boomers that are becoming the older generation. I'm wondering what challenges you perceive based on the generational differences, I suppose. So somebody who grew mm -hmm. up more with the internet, the TV, yep. the different types of medicine, how do you see that's going to change the yep. type of care that you have to give in a year? Yeah, yeah, well, that's the care you're gonna have to give. You're gonna bring it to me, so <laughs> it's what your challenges are. So that's a great question. I think, I think probably the biggest difference between um, the generation that's now the very elderly and dying off and being replaced by us baby boomers is that um, the expectations are incredibly different. And it's not really, I think, less the technology, because people are amazingly adaptable. They adapt to all the new technology. It's the generation that came before, um, grew up in the Depression, they grew up in World War II. Um, they just took life on, and they just said, this is what life has dealt me. Um, I really didn't have any power over this. I don't have any power of my health now. You doc, you're the expert. You do what you think is best for me. We ain't going to be like that. Um, uh, we know what's most important to us. We're going to come to you as the experts and who we are. Our expectation is, you know, this is what's most important to me, doc. Tell me how I can do it, or this is what you need to do. And I think that's, I think that's both a blessing and a curse. I think it's mostly a blessing, frankly. Um, and um, I think that you're going to be partners with your patients much more than we are currently. I find that really terrific. I think if you're threatened by that, it can be a difficulty. If you embrace it, I think it's really terrific because I think they will be much more, they will be much more knowledgeable 
about not just the outcomes that I talked about earlier that are most important to them, but they'll have a better sense of whether those treatments are likely to give them that outcome or not. So I think go into this thinking about being a partnership. What you have is the knowledge and the skills. That's what you bring to the table. So it's not either they're in control or you're in control. Think about it as a partnership. You have the skills and expertise of really understanding disease and illness and how treatments can affect that. They have the expertise and what's most important to them. You put that together and you both come. It's an equal footing and a partnership where you're both empowered to do the piece. That, and I think that's what's going to be different about the kind of medicine you practice than currently is. And I think it's a good thing. So unfortunately, we don't have much time. So maybe last question. And hopefully that'll be changing as we're getting on in our careers. But in the meantime, do you have advice for how to practice in a way that addresses that reality? Yeah, so I think you're in a transition period. And transition periods are always difficult. So you're learning under one system, and you're going to be practicing under another. And so it's a time of transition. So you got to kind of you kind of got to do a little bit of both. I think if there's one thing that you can do is 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 just be cognizant of asking each of your patients what's most important to them because I think even under the current model there are ways then, then even if you're talking about single diseases and uh, the current model the, it can still influence your decision making. Um, and it's things like, um, I think one of the things that you can get away from this notion of people being compliant and not compliant or adherent and not adherent and think about, okay, the reason people aren't adherent is because they're not willing to put up with the, out the symptoms that you are. So I think even under the current system, you have a lot of flexibility about are you going to use disease uh, drug a or drug B? Are you going to really focus on this outcome or that? So even in this transition period, I think if you really get from your patients, most, what are your goals? What's most important to you? Uh, I start every interview with every patient, whether I'm in my geriatric service, I also attend on the regular medical service. I start every interview with what's most important to you. And all my decision making still gets predicated even under the disease model with that. So that's one piece of advice I think you can do today. Okay, okay, so I think that wraps okay. up our session. Um, I would like to thank Dr. Tinetti again for such um, wisdom and, and, and sharing her experience and time with us today. So why don't we give her a round of applause. Thank you for inviting me, it's been wonderful. So here's just a small token of applause. Thank you so much. So hi everyone, I met a lot of you already. My name is Catherine Chang and I'm the NGIG chair for this past year. It's very nice to see everyone here and thank you for coming today. So I'm really excited to kind of introduce our first topic of the, of the, after, or of the morning, I suppose. Um, so we won't be having that break that is scheduled, but I hope that's okay with everyone since we're kind of getting ramped up and I hope we're all getting excited for the talks we have ahead. Um, also, um, if at the next break, if you don't have a binder in front of you, please let us, me or Patrick know. Patrick's our conference chair. I think he introduced himself earlier, but in case um, he's the brains behind the whole uh, conference today. But um, please let us know so we can get you with the binder and the materials and the resources for the talks. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our next speakers. So our first topic for that for the session is on physiology and pathology of aging. And we have two wonderful speakers with us here today. We have Dr. Samir Sinha, as well as Dr. Camila Wong, who will be discussing with us uh, their talk. So Dr. Samir Sinha will be going first. So I've been told that I do not need to give the extensive, extensive accomplishments that they've both made, uh, but it is in your binder if you want to read. So very quick overview. So with Dr. Sinha, um, he's the newly appointed expert lead on Ontario seniors strategy and is um, the director of geriatrics at Mount Sinai as well as the um, University Health Network Hospitals. Uh, he's assistant professor at the, of medicine at U of T and at John Hopkins University School of Medicine. 
Uh, and I've had a, the lovely opportunity to do an elective with him in the past, and I can tell you he's a wonderful uh, speaker as well as passionate about geriatrics. A little bit about Dr. Wong so that the transition can be quite smooth. Um, Dr. Wong is a geriatrician at St. Mike's Hospital. She's also assistant professor at the University of Toronto and associate scientist at the Lega Sheng Knowledge Institute. And it's quite the beautiful place, I have to say. I was there the other day. Um, her clinical and research interests are in uh, developing, uh, evaluating no models of acute care for older adults. All right, so that's a little bit about them. Unfortunately, due to time, I can't give you their extensive uh, accomplishments. But first, I'd like to call up Dr. Samir Sina to speak with us. Thank you very much. And uh, Camille and I are thrilled uh, to be doing these sessions with you this morning. We, we, we've been, we both were doing our training together, and now we're both practicing on, on e either side of Young Street. And we like to call, because Camilla works at uh, St. Michael's Hospital, SMH, and I'm based at Mount Sinai, MSH. We call ourselves Anagram Geriatrics. Um, and so we never mind if any of you want to do an elective with either of us, as long as it's with either of us. You know? <laughs> so anyway, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the biology of aging and the physiology of aging and try and really keep it high level, um, but practical, just to give you a little bit of a flavor of what this is. Because I can tell you, when I was doing my fellowship training in the US, um, we had a whole year-long course on this. So there's a ton of stuff to actually learn around the biology and the physiology of aging and so on. So I mean, um, I'll just tell you the points that I only remember because that's what I'm going to talk about today. So, uh, so really we're going to review some of the normal biological and physiological changes that occur as we age and we're going to identify some practical tips. So how does this actually influence the way that you would care for um, your older patients? So this is actually one of my patients. His name is Mr. W. He lives just about five minutes uh, away from here. Anybody want to guess how old Mr. W is? Test your skills. 84. Ooh, 84. We had 103, exactly. So I can tell who's been seeing some of my presentations. 76. He's just turned 103 on February 17th. Um, and, uh, and there are lots of clues. One of the things that you'll, uh, you'll, uh, you'll work on as a geriatrician is your, uh, is your ability to actually determine a lot about the actual individual. So you can see that we, you know, it's, you know if you can't guess people's ages, and I find it very hard to actually guess people's ages um, these days because I have lots of patients of, of, daring, of, of varying age and also varying abilities. Um, you can see some clues in terms of about Mr. W here. Um, you can see, for example, that he's wearing glasses, right? So he may have some visual uh, challenges. Um, you can ch does anybody want to guess how his, uh, what his mini mental score was last week? Anybody have a clue in the picture? 29. 29. Why do you say that? got two Rubik's cubes there, absolutely, right? So, so all of a sudden you can start getting some clues about this individual um, without you know, having even spoken to him as well. So it's kind of those powers of observation that are really helpful and then understanding that as we age, we all age very, very differently um, as well. So the aging process um, is, uh, is one that is a normal process, first of all, and it's one where we experience changes as we age. And so here's just a few things that we always want to think about as we age. So first of all, there's the concept of skeletal and muscle changes. So people have heard about osteopenia and osteoporosis, and we heard a great uh, session yesterday um, from, uh, from some of our experts. Um, but how many of you have actually heard of sarcopenia before today? Okay, just one hand, okay. So, and, and that's the reality. Many of us don't talk about it, but if we've all heard about osteoporosis or osteopenia, we should all be thinking about sarcopenia as well. Because as we grow old, as we get older, you have to remember that we've, been, we've evolved uh, so that we can, you know, pretty much we're supposed to reproduce, you know, and, and extend, you know, kind of our bloodlines, if you will, and our gene pool. So the idea is that we basically want to be physically robust and strong to bear and, and raise children um, by our 20s and 30s and so on. And after that, after you've done the deed, you're no longer useful. So, you know, the longer you get from those ages, you know, we don't really care what happens. That's why menopause hits in and, and other andropause hits in. And, and so by that point, you're just kind of sitting around and a bit biologically redundant in a sense. So you have to remember that when you think about kind of evolutionary pattern and, and what we're like, you have to understand that our peak bone and muscle mass actually occurs in our late 20s, our early 30s. 
Okay, so, so you have to think about an older person. Is an older person as strong as a younger person? Not really, right? And does an older person have as much muscle or bone mass as a, as a younger person? So we, uh, Dr. Papineau was saying yesterday that, you know, like older people will say, you know, I've shrunk a little bit as I've grown older, right? A sign of osteoporosis, for example. But the other thing is you'll find older people are less muscular than they were. So this is what we call sarcopenia or osteopenia, referring to those bone and muscle cells and how they shrink and how they actually decrease in numbers as we actually age. And so the thing that I want you to remember is I always say that bone and muscle equal function and they equal strength. So if you have more bone and more muscle, you're stronger, but as you get older, if you have less bone and muscle, you'll become weaker. That's why you start actually seeing that older people can actually have problems with their proximal muscle weakness um, and their strength and ability. So functional decline for older, older adults becomes uh, much more of a, of a strong risk factor as well. So cognitive and memory changes are, are really important as well. So we know that as we get older, for example, is our memories as good as when we were younger? Okay, we're seeing a lot of, yeah, no. But is dementia a normal part of aging? No, right? So I think that's one of the key things. I had a lady the other day in clinic and she was saying, like, do I have dementia? So she scored a 28 out of 30 on her mini mental. She got a 27 out of 30 on her mocha. Um, and the key is that we always say that, yes, as you get older, you're not going to be as quick, you know, with, with, it sometimes takes you a bit longer to learn new things. It's sometimes, you know, it's sometimes a bit harder to retrieve things. People always joke about having those senior moments where, what was that name? What was going on? Those are all normal parts of aging our memory and our and our and our cognitive functions will slow a bit over time that's normal but what's abnormal is when your memory impairments or those cognitive impairments start impairing with your ability to do things so when it starts interfering with your ability to do your banking or use transit or manage your medications or to dress or bathe yourself then we know that that's abnormal and that's the fine line between normal memory problems and and what we'd even call mild cognitive impairment and actually when you actually have a dementia for example so important to know that there are normal cognitive changes with as we age hearing and visual changes so as we get older we know that our hearing will likely um, change over time so 25 percent of older adults actually have hearing problems and you can think about that you know the one of the things i always say to my patients is when they say why is my hearing getting bad why do we get to have problems with our hearing as we age and i always like to say mileage right so think of this concept of when you have a new car or you have a new bike or something you know the longer you use it and the longer you have it for example it starts to wear down over time so our joints start wearing down you know our hearing especially if you listen to a lot of loud music when you were younger or you were doing um, sorts of work that involved a lot of noise for example you will have more mileage if you are more wear and tear um, affecting your hearing um, and uh, and visual changes are normally going to occur as well so things like the lens of your eye will tend to yellow as you get older. Um, it becomes harder to see contrast as well. So there are normal changes that happen with our vision, hence why more of us start wearing glasses as we get older as well. And then there are the physiological changes um, that occur as well, and we'll talk a little bit more about some of these aspects um, in, in particular. So to give you an example, this is kind of what it looks like if, you're, if you have normal vision and you're looking at this image. Okay, and now this is what it looks like if you actually have a cataract. And we know the cataracts increase as we get older. And this is what it's like if you have age-related macular degeneration. So you have this spot in the middle of your eye, and so patients will tell you they have to kind of look around um, to try and get around the spot, for example. Um, and then the glaucoma um, is when you have more of effect of your peripheral vision as well. So these are things that are more likely to occur as we age, and it's just important to understand that these are things that can happen. So why it's important to detect some of these things because they can be treated, and in some cases prevented um, as well. So one clear example I want to give to you is that of the aging process and medications. So as we age, our tolerance to medications lessens. So there are two things that happen, and I think this is going to be the most important thing for you as you think about as you're, as you're, as you're going through clerkship as well, um, and then into your residencies, is that medications, uh, for example, there are two key points that I want you to take home with from today. One is that as we get older, we have a decrease, what we call a first pass effect in our livers. So when you're 
processing medications, you, you, know, you, you know, eat your medications, you know, they get then absorbed into your bloodstream, then they basically work themselves out around to your liver and or your kidney, uh, where they're going to be processed and broken down. They're going to be metabolized, for example, and then they can actually have their effect, for example. So the key is that we have a decrease as we get older, that first pass effect will decrease over time, meaning that if you're not breaking down that medication as quickly, um, then you're going to have more of it actually around and active in your bloodstream. So what does that actually mean? What happens to the concentration of a medication as that first pass effect decreases? Absolutely, it goes up, right? So that medication that you took a few years ago might be more potent today because it might take a few cycles um, through your, through going through your liver before it's all fully broken down. The next aspect is, are we drier or are we more, uh, are we more wet as, as we get older? Yeah, people are saying drier, right? So more wrinkly, for example. So one of my attendings used to say, just water the older person, and then they'll they'll sprout up again, basically. So we, we tend to be more dry as we get older. That's you know why we're a bit more wrinkly, if you will, uh, to a certain extent. And so because of that, if you have less fluid on board, you have a less of a volume of concentration in which you can actually distribute that uh, that that medication. So less of it, less volume for actually to. Uh, to allow that medication to actually be uh, to be uh, available, and so what happens to the concentration of that medication when there's less volume? To, uh, to what happens to that? Absolutely, it goes up, right? So this is why it becomes really important that when you're having an older person who said, "I've been on that lorazepam, that Ativan." For years, that's my sleeping tablet that I've been taking for years. So, you know, why are you telling me it's causing problems now? It never caused me any problems for 30 years. Or I've had hypertension for the last 30 years. I've always taken these three medications. How are you telling me that that medication can be problematic? So I give you the example of a patient who's falling now. And we know that these medications, we just heard from Dr. Tonetti that you know, too much of a blood pressure medication can significantly increase your risk of falls and falls with serious injury as well because you have too low blood pressure on board now. When so something we call cerebral hypoperfusion, so you might have some confusion, but you also might be more dizzy and prone to fall. Just same way that with lorazepam or Ativan or any of the benzodiazepines, that as you increase that effect, it can actually increase your risk of being more or unbalanced or unsteady and therefore even people say I don't feel unsteady but we know that it actually does affect your balance um, and can significantly increase your risk of falls hence why one thing that we will do as geriatricians is we keep a close eye on blood pressure and we might start backing off on medications backing off on doses because we know that this actually happens Okay, so higher concentrations of drugs. So look closely at what an older person takes and ask yourselves these things. Is that medication or supplement still appropriate? And we had a really good talk before that. Um, is there anything missing as well? So it's not a matter of just cutting down medications or a term I like to use is pharmacological debridement, right? We're cutting down, cutting down, cutting down medications. But also, are they on calcium and vitamin D? And we heard that in the osteoporosis lecture yesterday. Patients should probably be on calcium and vitamin D um, if they're at risk of osteoporosis. So again, thinking about anything that might be missing. And is it dosed appropriately, right? So not just that they're on that, but you know, as Dr. Papanow was saying yesterday, you know, make sure that you're not on 400 of vitamin D, and they sell all varying levels of it in the drugstore. Make sure they're on the right amount in particular. Particular. So, in conclusion, so you'll see Mr. W walks with a walker, and I wanted to bring back for one point in particular that when you actually have decreased muscle mass and decreased bone over time, you have something we call proximal muscle weakness. So, a test you can always do when you're in the clinic um, is you can always ask an older person, can you just stand up like this? And you'll notice that some of your older patients, they'll have trouble standing up and they'll want to kind of use the armrest and so on. If your patient has trouble getting up from a chair without using their arms, for example, you can tell there's some, there's some, uh, um, their muscles are less strong in those proximal, and those are your strongest muscles in the body. That increases your risk for falls. So I do that routinely with Mr. W. Whenever I go around, I'm really thrilled when he comes and answers the door himself because it told me that he transferred from his chair that you saw at the beginning. He walked about 20 feet over to his door. He opened it, but he always giggles because every time I go see him, we go on a walk around his apartment. I see him sitting down and up in his bed. I see him sitting up and off the toilet, for example. I watch that to see how he's doing his transfers. And whenever he gets weak, 
um, because he's had a recent illness and he's had some functional decline, we always make sure that he starts back on an exercise routine so that he can stand up without actually having to use his arms. So again, some really key things to think about as we age and some of those important things that why they're important and how it will actually impact the way you practice with your patients, okay? I can take one question before the other start of Dr. Wong. Any questions? Go ahead, we'll take two, okay. No, it's a great question. So I think, again, first of all, it's always looking at your patient and understanding kind of what is their mobility issue, for example. So if you know that there's unsteadiness and there's, and there's a, a problem maintaining their balance, then probably figuring out, you know, A, look at the underlying reasons of what might be, is it medication related or is it just kind of they have, they may have had a stroke in their cerebellum, for example, and they may have some fundamental ideas or they may have peripheral neuropathies due to diabetes. So understand the cause of that. Figure out is there anything you can do to remedy that. And then if it's an issue about work walking with a gait aid, for example, I always recommend getting a physiotherapist involved. So again, it's working with your team because then they can actually assess do they just need some balance and strength training and then they can mobilize on their own? Or do they actually need a mobility device? And you, will get a, you can get a whole lecture on mobility devices. But the key is there's a whole range. As you said, there's single point canes, there are walkers, there are rollators, there are wheelchairs, for example. And I think the key is understanding how that person's actually maintaining their balance, where is the, what's the level of weakness and injury, and then what are you trying to mitigate that way. But just as having a device can be helpful, sometimes having a device can be harmful if it's not being used properly or measured properly as well. So sometimes the walker's too high or too low, the cane's too high or too low, so learning how to measure those devices and, and how to get a therapist involved to look at those devices can be helpful. So what there, yeah, so there's no kind of, there's no, you know, there's no protection in the legislation per se, but you know, what, what I always do is I, you know, again, it's having a dialogue with your patients and I think it really builds on what Dr. Tinetti's panel was about. It's actually asking kind of, what's your goal here? And my patient says, I don't want to be falling so much. Then I say, we can try this. Now the key is we want to keep an eye on your blood pressure, so it's a partnership. We want to look at your blood pressure, we want to look at symptoms, and I take patients off medications all the time, but I kind of say, this is the risk, this is the benefit, what do you want to do? And they'll say, you know what, I'm, I'm, I want to try off that medication. I say, and then, you know, and I basically say, this is what I want to do. So the key is, you know, that, um, you know, even putting on medications can cause harm, taking patients off medications can cause benefit and vice versa. So I think the key is always having that conversation around, understand what the goal is, understand what are some of the risks that of potentially taking someone off a medication, how are you gonna monitor for those risks? And as long as you document that, and as long as you know it's documented and there's a conversation around that, patients will never, I've never had a patient upset with me, even if I'm like, ooh, you know, I had a patient call me the other day going, that regimen's not working at all, you need to do something. And I'm like, fair enough. So it's about having that dialogue and documenting that. Perfect, thank you. So um, I guess as we're loading up the presentation for Dr. Wong, I just wanted to present Dr. Sina with our token of our appreciation and thank you for your time for being here with us today. I'm not sure if you're staying for the reception. So. Thank you. I'm going to stay for Camilla's Perfect. and uh, please come do electives with us. Yes. We always love having students. And so um, in the meantime, I just want to give everyone a forewarning. Uh, Dr. Wong actually has another commitment in the other room in a few minutes at 11, but hopefully we can keep her for a few more. So if you have questions for her, feel free to find her during the conference. So just as a heads up. So I apologize. I'm uh, booked back to back. Sorry about that. So um, thanks, Samir. Um, so first of all, I want to say congratulations to uh, Patrick and Catherine, everyone else who was involved in organizing this. I'm just trying to think. I think we were sort of the cohort. We were dating ourselves now, but we were sort of the cohort where there were what, only what, five new geriatricians a year, right? You know, 
people are like, why would you want to do that? So I'm going to pose a question to my favorite person in the audience, Dr. Sinha. Why did you choose to go into geriatrics? Because it gives you permission to care for the whole patient. Okay, good. Any other answers? Why are people here interested in going into geriatrics? I hope you are. But uh, any other takers? Dr. Wu, why, why are you a geriatrician? Why do you love your job? I love the stories. You like the stories? Yeah, so stories, caring for the whole person. Dr. Tanetti, who is, you know, a guru in the field, says, you know, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, you can, you're welcomed into a person's very personal life. It, it's a very meaningful and humbling interaction. I see another hand there. You need an approach of common sense. I love it. Okay, so so we're hearing the words complexity, common sense, and uh, we also heard from Dr. Rockwood, who's probably one of our most well-known geriatricians in Canada. Like, you know, as geriatricians, what we really essentially do is embrace complexity. So you really have to embrace complexity, and with complexity comes frailty. Okay, so they're they're, they're sort of similar concepts. It's just how you want to frame it. So um, so you can sort of think of frailty as. Uh, you know, older people, frail older people, you can sort of think of as very complicated systems on the brink of failure, right? So what, what does a frail old person look like to you? Anyone? It's like the little old lady who, you know, you're just gonna, right? You're just gonna blow and she's gonna tip over and she's gonna end up in hospital, right? That's, that's like the frail little old lady, right? So complex system on the brink of failure, okay? So one, aspect of working in a complex system that's on the brink of failure is that what fails first is actually what we call the higher order functions. Okay, so higher order functions in humans. What differs us from the chimps? This, you don't need to know anything about geriatrics to answer this question. So how are we fundamentally different from chimps? Bipedal upright ambulation, good. Good, we have ability to reason and behave appropriately, have meaningful social interactions. Other takers, how are we different from the chimps? Monogamy. Uh, arguable, uh, yeah, monogamy, oh, that's a whole other topic. Okay, well, we had, we had some very good answers. Okay, so one is we are, have the ability to have divided attention, right? We can shift from one task to another. Okay, upright bipedal ambulation, opposable thumbs, right? And social interaction. So when we talk about complex systems on the brink of failure, we think about higher order functions that fail first. And so how does that manifest in older people? in frail older people. Well, divided attention, they don't have, they, when they have a problem with that, they present as delirium. Upright bipedal ambulation, when they're on the brink of failure, they fall. Opposable thumbs, when they're on the brink of failure, well, functional decline, they lose their ability to function. Social interaction, well, they become socially isolated or they're abandoned by, you know, by their social circle. Okay, so that's one way of thinking about it. Another way of conceptualizing frailty is you can think of it as, um, so you have a green line here with someone who's not frail and then someone who's a red line who is quite frail. And we talked about the little old lady, you just sort of blow on her and she'll fall, right? So it's, it's a way of looking at their vulnerability and their ability to return back to that homeostasis, right? So someone who's not frail, they're gonna have just a little bit of an interruption and that's it. But someone who's frail, even a small insult is really going to result in a striking and disproportionate change in their health state. So basically going from independent to dependent, mobile to immobile, postural stability to falling, or lucid to delirious. Okay, so this is another sort of visual way of thinking about frailty. Um, we heard a little bit about this. If you've served in the geriatrics world long enough, you serve, you'll, you'll see Dr. Rockwood at every single lecture, and he'll always have some commentary. He'll always bring it back to frailty, and his framework of frailty. So there's basically two large camps out there. Anyone from Halifax out here? Okay, so I can say this with openness then. So, so, <laughs> so, so if, if you read the frailty literature, there's basically two large camps. You can think of it as the American way and the Canadian way, the Freed way or the Rockwood way. Um, so, so one concept is you can think of frailty as a phenotype, okay? And basically look at a cohort of a bunch of people and they said, well, you know, we're gonna look at these five things that are measurable. Slowness, loss of weight, impaired strength, exhaustion, or low physical activity. If you have three or more of these, you're gonna be deemed as frail, okay? And that means that you're gonna be vulnerable to adverse health outcomes. So this is the phenotype. In contrast to, I think, what Dr. Rockwood was trying to market in his, uh, uh, 
after the sort of the discussion period in the plenary session is the cumulative deficit model. So you look at this list and you're like, oh my gosh, that's a lot of stuff, right? So the way a frailty index score is calculated is you take a bunch of different items and you count how many of those items that person has, okay? And you express it as how many items they have over all the number, as a ratio of all the number of items that are being considered. But I think the key point here is we're not just talking about comorbidity. If you look at the list, there are things like toileting problems, uh, problems cooking. So they're not necessarily comorbidities. They're also looking at function. They're looking at you know, social vulnerability. So it can be all sorts of different things. The, the criteria for it to be an item on this deficit model is one, it has to be considered a health deficit. So it has to be associated with an adverse health outcome. And number two, it has to increase in prevalence with age at least until the ninth decade. Okay, so it has to be saturated, but not too early. So you think of it as a score. So for example, I'm looking at uh, Samir here. Say he has problems with toileting. He has onset of cognitive symptoms. And he has paranoid features. Let's give him those things, right? So it's, it's three out of 100 things that are being considered. So we would rate his frailty index score as three out of 100, or 0 0.03, okay? And the cutoff that's been used to measure frailty, non-frailty, is a value of 0.25. The key thing is the denominator. You can list as many things as you want, anywhere from three to 100 things. So you make up the items, okay? So that's, that's sort of the cumulative deficit model. So if you're, you know, being an evidence-based person, you're saying, well, is the person in front of me frail? Well, the answer to it is, well, they would conform to frailty if they either meet the phenotypic definition, which was the first model, or they have a frailty index score greater than 0.25. Okay, so either are acceptable. The good thing is, even though we can think of it as American versus Canadian, Freed versus Rockwood, at the end of the day, the good thing is that both of them have convergent predictive ability to predict adverse health outcomes, so hospitalizations, institutionalization, and death. And so we talked about what is frailty. The question is, why measure it? Well, I already sort of told you, it predicts adverse health outcomes. But I think the other important thing that we're, we had talked about you know, and, the, and the theme was you know, during the plenary session is it's important because it helps inform clinical decision making. If we can't tell in front of us if this person is frail and we're proposing a certain treatment, well, maybe we're actually exposing them to more harm than good. But there's also the opposite is true, right? If we're just defining them by chronological age, like Mr. W, 103, of course I'm not going to do this elective hip surgery, just based on his age. Well, that's just ageist, right? So it's very important to actually have a conceptual framework for frailty, be able to measure it, because it's actually gonna help you in caring for that complex patient and helping you have that discussion of personal preference and values, but also a very informed decision-making in terms of risks and benefits. Okay, so the last part of it is, okay, so I know how to define frailty, I know why I should measure it. Then the last thing is, well, can I actually prevent frailty? Is there a fountain of youth or is there a magic pill? So I'm gonna start with the complex answers first. So, um, so my, my clinical practice is I'm just, I only do inpatient geriatrics, acute geriatrics. So I'm gonna start off with that. So I'm gonna give validity to what I do every day, which is um, the comprehensive geric, it's just sex geriatric assessments. I think you may learn about a bit more about that during your workshops today. But if you look at the highest level of evidence, which is systematic reviews of randomized controlled trials, basically looking at 22 RCTs of doing comprehensive geriatric assessment versus those who just get what we call usual care. Comprehensive geriatric assessment was associated to be with, for patients to be more likely alive in their own homes, less likely to be institutionalized, and more likely to have improved cognitive function. So all good health outcomes. If you're more like Samir and you have a, well, I know you do inpatients, but you also do outpatient community-based practice. But if you're also here for his talk yesterday on the Ontario senior strategy, well, what are the things that are being proposed in that strategy? Well, it's actually all stuff that has good evidence base. So these are based on systematic reviews. If you're a community-dwelling senior, well, how can you prevent frailty? Well, one is see a geriatrician for a comprehensive geriatric assessment. There's good evidence to show that that assessment and that management will result in decreased institutionalization rates. Home care is a big thing that he, that's being pushed forward in this Ontario senior strategy because, again, that type of intervention is going to keep people out of long-term care. Home visits, so bringing back primary care, multidisciplinary, home-based care to people who are frail seniors. Well, again, that also has good evidence 
that it's going to decrease institutionalization. So yes, you can prevent frailty in those that are out in the community. Now some of you may think, well, okay, what about the ones that are already in long-term care? They're the frailest of the frail. Like what function is there left to preserve? You know, we should, well, just let them languish there. Okay, that's one way of thinking of it. But if we actually also look at trials to preserve function in those that are in long-term care, um, there's actually good systematic review evidence for having physiotherapy, okay? So after looking at 49 different trials, all of them came up with the same conclusion. Those that have physiotherapy are more likely to have improved function and um, be able to move around, okay? So, um, so geriatrics is complex. Everyone's always looking for the magic pill. So is there a magic pill for, for frailty? Any takers? Okay, so we don't have a drug sponsor for that, right? So um, there, there's been a lot of interest in looking at sarcopenia, right? So ACE inhibitors can improve muscle structure, testosterone improves muscle strength, vitamin D improves muscle function, but when tested, it actually doesn't do anything in terms of the fountain of youth, okay? So it's still controversial. So I guess in conclusion, so the three things that I wanted you to learn is frailty can be defined. Okay, you can either think of it as a phenotype or of a cumulative deficit model. It predicts adverse outcomes. And then it's also important because there's actually good evidence on ways we can actually prevent it. Okay, so that's, that's all. Thank you, Dr. Wong. I feel like I'm running out of the top, but thank you for staying, and I know you have to go, so can... Sorry, I have to go, but... Uh, we'll just... Yeah, sounds good. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Sorry about that. So for our next speaker, we have Dr. Chris Frank, who is over there, um, and he is um, going to be talking about um, end-of-life care and kind of like the principle of palliative care. This morning, they put up, this afternoon is not for, oh. first thing this morning, they put up my 11 o'clock talk, so. This is, um, we'll somehow networking breakfast in, I've got a, I've got a, it, you know, okay. yeah. try, that, that shouldn't be it, but it is. Yeah, it's not. So I'm really pleased to be here again, and I, I did want to once again pass on my congratulations for pretty much everything that the gigs have done. I mean, it's been really wonderful seeing it start and very involved in Queens and watching it grow there and all over the place. So thank you for inviting me, and I am not worthy. Um, I'm sure that I, I requested that there be internet, and I was assured that there would be by Bobby, so we'll see whether it actually works, because I'm going to try to do less talking and have some really great Canadian acting shown, but also a, a couple of videos that hopefully are helpful. But palliative care, what is it? Why do we do it? And I come from that generation where the, or the era rather, when palliative care was, was not in medical school, um, it, you kind of drifted into it, and it wasn't something that people had really clearly defined. And I think now, I mean, I'm saying, what is it? Um, so clearly there's still aspects of uncertainty, but I think everybody kind of knows that palliative care is an important part of care. And I think it's very interesting too that people that go into, have a real interest in geriatrics from a family medicine perspective, very, very commonly have a very strong interest in palliative care. Kind of ties into, uh, into that aspect of the stories and that kind of interest in the life trajectory, et cetera. I do find it interesting and I'm happy to hear comments that sometimes the internist geriatricians don't consistently have that sort of interest in palliative care, which is really goes along with the family medicine approach, which doesn't really mean all that much other than the fact that, uh, I don't know, what does it mean? Well, no, I just find it very interesting that you know, it's certainly, palliative care traditionally has been viewed as a realm of family medicine, and I think that, you know, no matter what aspect of care you're providing with older people, you know, most of them are going to be some point within 5, 10, or 15 years of death. The patient may not realize it, so I've had folks that are 95 going, I might die sometime, um, but anyway, I'm going to get myself in trouble as I have once in a teleconference talking about internist geriatricians, and sometimes that 
less variable. It's, it's just a different, it's a different perspective. Yeah. But I think we are kind of looking towards that chronic care, chronic disease management model. And I think that's a much, it's opening up a lot more. I think it is. I would agree. So what do you want me to talk about? I've got slides, but I can always. Is there anything particular that is a burning interest to folks? I'm not going to get a lot into choose morphine over hydromorphone in these circumstances, clearly. Is there anything, any specific uh, things that people are really interested in? That's a great question. I'm going to I'll hold that thought in our mind because I probably should have done this at the end, but sometimes setting the context is good. So I will look to you to revitalize that question if we, if we don't cover it. I think that's an excellent one. And, and let's face it, that is you know, a very common concern that particularly I find people working in acute care hospitals have is like the patient's ready and the family's not ready to kind of change the course of plan. Any other thoughts like that? Okay, so I, I don't have uh, any disclosure and I have no relationship with commercial interests. Uh, so a brief history of my own career in palliative care. This is not actually me when I graduated from medical school, but this is actually how a fair number of people looked. Um, <laughs> this is actually, I think, the lead singer from A Flock of Seagulls, just to age me. So, uh, so I, how did I end up doing palliative care? What kind of drew me to geriatrics in the first place was you know, at that, that point, the whole concept of care of the elderly was not really well known. I was actually the second person in the country to do care of the elderly training. Um, but what always drew me to things in family medicine was that aspect of the story, their relationship, that connection to kind of bigger things than just what their creatinine was. Um, and literally, I, I finished my residency training, had had no exposure to palliative care, but at Hotel Du Hospital, there was a group of people that were setting up a palliative care consult service. And it was very multidisciplinary. There's, you know, there was a couple of very fierce nuns involved. Um, there was a number of nurses involved. And there was a number of people, and most of us had absolutely no background in palliative care other than just being really interested in it. So I certainly remember doing consults, and the residents were coming up going, OK, what do you want to do? And I quite literally had just read up on the subject on my way in the door. You know, so you can actually do that and do it reasonably well, but it's not very much fun and it's not good for your stress level. So I really fell into it at a time and I think it's been really wonderful to see, um, to see, to see the evolution that's happened. How I ended up getting much more involved was very kind of palliative related to is that I started working in a palliative care unit because one of the physicians got lung cancer. Um, and the good news is he's still a colleague 15 years down the road. Um, but you often will fall into things and I think that your passions will often find you opportunities and I think that's particularly true with something like palliative care which until recently was something that nobody really ever considered doing as part of their work. Um, they sort of just ended up sliding into it. So I think there's lots of reasons that we're interested in death in that it's uh, you know, pretty much a universal experience. Um, and I, I, I think of memorable scenes in books and films, um, you know, lots of poetry, lots of films. So what are some of the people's interesting humanities experiences with death? Because I think that is what we do bring to our patient encounters often is that understanding of things that we might have from personal experience. But for many people in their 20s, they don't necessarily have a lot of experience with death and dying themselves within their families. Um, you know, and often we're bringing other experiences to the table. Did you? Um, like, are you asking for? Yeah, I mean, what, what, what things might guide your perspective on death and dying? Before I even considered going into medicine, I think the first thing that got me interested in palliative care was a play called Wit by Margaret Edson. Mm -hmm. It's about a 50 year old professor of 17th century English poetry who is diagnosed with cancer, and the play follows her through her experience as a patient. Um, and it's really powerful and it's really moving, and she uh, does a really good job of examining like, all of these themes and death. And it's now, it's a film with Emma Thompson. We, it is, yeah. Yeah, yeah which actually gets used at Queen's for clinical skills teaching just because some of the residents are such knobs. It's <laughs> unbelievable. So, 
Any other thoughts? I think that's a real, I, I've seen so much of the film and clinical skills teaching that I've never seen the whole thing and I always intend to. Yeah, I will. Thank you. Any other sort of uh, humanities applications to your experiences with care? That's great, thank you. I've heard of that, but I didn't know what it was about, so. Um, I actually just had been on a bit of a Tolstoy tear recently, and uh, I reread The Death of Ivan Illich, partly just because I knew I was preparing for this, and it's a very short novel, and I really do recommend it, because I was really struck by, Tolstoy was extremely frightened to death, but he really captures this person's transition from their understanding of their illness to that extreme terror of death, and I, I was really quite taken, having read it many years ago, with how well it seems to reflect some of my patients' experiences. And this is obviously Emily Dickinson, that short poem. So when do you become palliative? And I, certainly I think this has changed too, but it used to be quite literally, you'd see in the notes, you know, so-and-so is now palliative. It's like, and they worked five minutes before. So I think this concept of, you know, trying to, you know, my, 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 I was, people at Queen's always know this line, my late mother's fridge magnet that said, life is a sexually transmitted illness that is always fatal. Um, you know, we're, we're all going to die. We're all palliative, essentially. It's just a matter of when it is that you're going to die. Um, you know, so I think that we should be conceptualizing our patients, particularly those with non-cancer diagnoses, because we're often not considering that that condition is going to be lethal for them you know, we're all palliative. It's a matter of when everybody comes to the realization that the goals of care have completely changed. And realistically, Mr. Wilson is not now palliative. Mr. Wilson now has a goal of care that has somewhat changed. And I think that's an important concept that becoming palliative is never a straight line, like a cross-sectional study. It's, it's a process and an evolution of thought and perspective. So I, I the old definition of palliative care, the one uh, developed uh, in, in Canada by Elizabeth Latimer, I think this has got used in the World Health Organization one, which is a, an approach that improves the quality of life of patients and their families facing the problem associated with life-threatening illness. And, and here, once again, it's a whole range of illnesses from MS to neuromuscular disease, other neuromuscular diseases to the big C. Through the prevention and relief of suffering by means of early identification, i.e., the worst thing you can do is, oh, and by the way, you're dying. Um, by means of early identification and impeccable assessment and treatment of pain and other problems, physical, psychosocial, and spiritual. And so, providing relief from pain and other distressing symptoms, affirming life and regards, sorry, the, 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 the care affirms life and regards dying as a normal process, intends neither to hasten or postpone death, integrates the psychological and spiritual aspects of patient care, offers a support system to help patients live as actively as possible until death. And I, I work in a palliative care unit, and the average life expectancy is about two to three weeks. And it's really interesting, the number of people that actually blossom, improve their function for a period of time before they die. So we'll say, you know, this isn't a rehab unit, but we have a physiotherapist. If you'd like to see us, um, if you'd like to see her, that, that would be really great. And uh, if people have just been in the room, often I'll go in and say, you don't actually have to stay in this room. Would you like us to try to get you a chair? And I tell you, I had an experience in the fall where a lady had not been out of the bed for a while. And I sort of said, would you, would you actually like to get out of this room? And then so she got outside in the last fleeting days of fall. And she came back and she said, I'm having a terrible day, but tomorrow I'm going outside again. You know, and it was just one of those really wonderful moments where it was just that aspect of, uh, of trying to affirm life um, while they were actually dying. Uh, offers a support system to help patients live as actively, offers a support system to help the family cope during the patient's illness and in their own bereavement. And honestly, the clinical clerk is often the best person on a medicine team to do this because they're the ones that are most likely to go in the room, they're the most likely to sit on the bedside and to talk and listen to people. So you guys' efficacy as a junior person is often much greater than the attending that might breeze in regally. You know, Dr. Powell accepted who would never breeze in anywhere regally. He'd always be very humble and, and, and approachable. 
uh, uses a team approach, enhanced quality of life, is applicable early in the course of illness in conjunction with other therapies that are intended to prolong life. So a good principle is that, you know, no matter what we're doing, we should always be focusing on quality of life, symptom management, etc. It's great if you can prolong people's life, but if they live for four months longer and are miserable the whole time because you're not paying attention to their symptoms, that's not what I call either good care and certainly not palliative care. So this is Reg. Uh, from a Channel 4 uh, documentary in the UK, which was all about uh, end-of-life care. And the whole thing was about, um, about end-of-life care in non-cancer patients. And Reg had heart failure, and he commented that because he had heart failure and didn't have cancer, that he wasn't given a free walker, he wasn't given transportation chits to get back and forth from the hospital, and his line was, you're better off with cancer. And I think that... Uh, it's a really important point that palliative care has always had kind of as its flagship the care of people with cancer. Um, and yet, you know, cancer kills a lot of people, but if, if we were looking at that talk this morning, symptoms and mortality, heart failure was right up there on doc one of Dr. Tinetti's slides. And if I was to say the conditions I see that cause the most morbidity in my rehab patients, um, you know, it probably is heart failure. So end-stage COPD, bad heart failure, neuromuscular diseases, these are all things that fly under the ra radar screen a little bit. And it's been very well shown that uh, uh, heart failure patients have an understanding of their prognosis much, much later in the trajectory of their illness than somebody with cancer, for example. So how do you dis discuss death and goals of care? The Robert Buckman spikes mnemonic is relevant. And this, does, this little video does not give you a perfect example of it, but I'll, I'll just uh, see if it works. Is it going to, will anything happen here? Anyway, I don't know if you were aware that April the 16th was National Advanced Care Planning Day. Um, and this Speak Up is a, is a sort of consortium trying to promote advanced care planning among, among sort of the, the regular public. What time did I actually start? That's great, thank you. How did you do that? Oh. We'll try this once and we'll skip the next link if it's going to. Thank you very much. Though. You're welcome. Perfect. So if you're from Kingston, you'll actually recognize some of the people in some of these videos. But I thought that this one really. You don't really need to see them, so I won't enlarge it. study coming out from the Mass General where the patients had seen a palliative care physician, I realized what the, that the game they got was that really they'd seen six people who knew how to, that, that's the staff of Mass General for palliative care, that they'd seen one of these six people who knew how to talk to them about the end of life. And so what I did was I went to those doctors and just said, I'm really bad at this. If you had to make a little list for me of what it is that I should talk about with people facing these problems. What would you put on that list? One of the doctors that I spoke to was a palliative care physician at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute named Susan Block. And Susan encapsulated, I thought, the best for me, at least in a way that I could use. She said that there were four things that she has as a little mental list in her head that she wants to talk about with a patient who's terminally ill. Number one, do they know their prognosis? Number two, what are their fears about what is to come? Number three, what are their goals? What they like to do as time runs short? And fourth, what are the trade-offs they're willing to make? How much suffering are they willing to go through for the sake of the possibility of added time? That list was really interesting to me. It was not a list asking, do you want a ventilator or do you not want a ventilator as you come to the end? Do you want your heart shocked? Do you not want your heart shocked? Her point was, if 
you tell me the answers to those questions, I can make a recommendation to you that says, you would not want this toward the end if these are your goals. Our misconception is that the conversation is about hard choices. Really, it's a conversation about asking people about what they want to look forward to as time runs short and what they fear the most. And the second misconception is that it's a, that, that arriving at what we want at the end is a kind of epiphany. Sign here, do you want hospice, do you not want hospice? It's not an epiphany, it's a process. It's a series of conversations and ups and downs as we go through a very hard uh, series of uh, uh, sequence of things that happen to you as you become ill and, and have things come to an end. So obviously I could have told you that, but I thought he did a better job than I would have. So. But I think that really highlights for you guys, particularly because when you're junior, the old way it used to be is like, clerk, go in and get the DNR. And I think here, you know, this is the type of conversation that you're sometimes forced to have in a very, you know, lump sum, you have to do it now. But often it's that aspect of understanding the patient's perspective, starting to talk about it, letting them ruminate, coming back. And that can happen during a short hospital stay as well. Um, you know, so you're forced into some strategies, but there are ways around some of those administrative requirements that I think if you take some of those principles are really helpful in getting to know your patient, understanding their perspective, and often that's a way of helping with family. If you have that patient's perspective, an important thing is it's really helpful for me to hear your perspective, you know, have, have you talk, talk to your family about this sort of thing. So that's one aspect of that answer is understanding the patient's perspective so you can use that perspective in working and understanding it in a bit of a structured approach as well. So I'm, I'm going to run out of time here, but I'm, this Pallium project, it has a number of videos that's really great old-fashioned Canadian acting. Um, but what it, what it is is a number of video vignettes of bad news discussions. And this one I was going to show was a heart failure patient where the guy's there with his wife and the, the doctor is um, talking about his recent stay for heart failure. And in the first one, they don't talk about anything. He, she just says, oh, your blood pressure's really good, oh, your weight's really good, etc." And in the second one, the doctor's very attentive to cues the patient has given, and he sort of says, oh, and the food was terrible, and the bed was like sleeping on a slab of stone. That's actually how he talks. Um, what's it? Okay, what am I doing wrong here? <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So you can see there's a whole bunch of things here that may be of interest to you. Um, and there's a lot of stuff to skip on these videos. For guidance and answers. And Forget all that reflective stuff. For how we practice. Well, the old heart was beating this morning. Is it still working? It wasn't a bad imitation, eh? It's still working, George. Good. I'm a little short of breath, though. Not doing too badly. Sure was glad to get out of that hospital. Thought they'd never let me go home. I bet you were. Let's just check your blood pressure. Looks like you're both doing a pretty good job. George, your blood pressure's in good shape today. Keep checking your weight and taking your medications every day. Call me if your weight goes up and I'll increase your water pill. I want to see you in two weeks. Do you really think he's doing okay? You're both doing a great job, Hattie. Okay, we'll see you. Once again, the poor doctor gets set up in this one, but she really doesn't jump at some of the subtle cues Three that are offered. Left, didn't you? And the food. A little short of breath, though. Are you? Not doing too badly. Sure was glad to get out of that hospital. Thought they'd never let me go home. What was the hardest 
hardest thing about being in the hospital? Uh, everything. The noise, the tests, and the food. It was awful. Those hospital beds are like slabs of stone. But Lord knows I'm going to be sleeping on one of them soon enough. Oh, George, you've got lots of good years left in you. But I can tell time's getting short. Now, George, I don't want you talking like that. Well, Hattie, you both know that George's heart condition is getting worse. And George, your comfort and quality of life are the most important things for us to consider. We've talked before about how unpredictable heart disease can be. And George, your heart is getting weaker. How much time are you looking at, Doc? That's hard to say. You're not a statistic, George. I'd say we're looking at months rather than years. Oh. Have you talked about the future? Yes, we have. And I like to take care of them at home. Maybe we should set up another appointment for you to come in and talk about your options for care. But things like where and what you'd like that care to be. That would be much appreciated, Doc. Okay, then let's just take a look at your blood pressure here. So, Eddie, what was the difference between the two? We don't need to go over all of that reflective stuff, but uh, what, what would you say the, the main differences were? Aside from the fact, as I said, that they, they set it up a little bit differently. Any comments on the second one? In some ways, I sort of made it, I was always thinking that it was, you know, the, the way it was set up from what the patient said, but I realized just watching it there that the question of, that moved beyond the kind of basic physiology of the situation to what was the, the most difficult thing, and that often is a really good question that will get you a lot of different answers. Any other comments about that? So I think that, you know, clearly we're not going to cover in a short time all of the nuances of this discussion, but I think trying to move you away from really some of the kind of very, as Dr. Gawande said in the first thing, that aspect of the checklist of technological choices. You're going to have to do that at some points, but try to, try to broaden it really. So I think how do geriatrics and palliative care overlap? One is, it sounds kind of funny, but in palliative care we focus on function. And there's nothing I like more than having, you know, going somebody with nausea, somebody with weakness, fatigue in a palliative care unit bed where they're supposed to be there to die going back and adjusting their medications like I do on my geriatric inpatient unit and having the person go, oh, I feel so much better. You know, so focusing on function is still relevant regardless of the time people have. The uh, evolving goals, so in geriatrics you may start with somebody and their goal is to do this and by the time you're finished with them the goal may be much changed, uh, quite modified. In geriatrics and in palliative care, very small changes make great functional and particularly quality of life changes. So you have to focus on the details and no small detail is worth not considering because they can all make big impacts to the patient. Communication is crucial and it's another area where teamwork is absolutely essential both in the community but in the hospital setting as well. So what do you get out of palliative care? This is the lady who's lived the oldest in history, that, you know, other than ladies in the Balkans eating yogurt um, who didn't have a, so she lived to be 122 I believe. Um, so what do, what, what do you think you get out of palliative care? Well, I'm trying to think if this was for me to answer or you guys. What do I get out of palliative care? Oh, go ahead. Uh, well, I usually do the palliative care elective. And I'm a palliative care really worried in the sense that, you know, you let people kind of, kind of choose how they want to, in the sense they let people choose how they want to live, but we also let them choose how they want to pass away and also their dignity and also their dignity. And just as a question, did you find it to be a very stressful or heartrending? Just out of curiosity, you might have, you might not have. So. Did uh, Get really attached to patients when you're new at this and 
Mm -hmm. And it's, it's rewarding to get to know the families. And so I think it's a, a very um, holistic kind of a, a field and the experience. So I would really encourage people to kind of get that experience. So I found it very, you know, some days are better days and everyone's doing quite well. And, and like what you described, if someone's walking out of their room, someone's kind of saying you leave a note, you know, we're saying a few weeks left. And then there's other days where everyone's not doing so well. So it's really uh, quite, uh, quite an experience. Well, I think, too, when you're not experiencing that emotional intensity for the first time, the vast majority of people would say, I do it because it's incredibly rewarding. So I was just covering for a day and walked into a room and sort of said, boy, this room feels really great. Like, the, you know, your, your dad is dying here, and I walk into this room and it's got such a really wonderful positive feel, and the people just launched into why all those things and why the dad had made them the way that they were. And, you know, I left, and the guy died about 10 minutes later, and, you know, I left going, that was a really great experience. It was a very, it was a family from Prince Edward County. They were, I think, sort of very rural, and they just took this, brought this approach to the care of that dad that was so incredibly heartwarming. And you really, I think you just get connected to something bigger. So it tends to be more rewarding, and people often shy away from it because of the concern, oh, how do you take all that emotional stuff? And the emotional stuff tends to be positive as opposed to negative for the most part. So. Questions and comments. I don't know. Did you have some thoughts on answering your 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 sort of perception or your your perspective earlier from any anything you might suggest that you took from from that talk that would apply to that how to help family members catch up maybe with their with their loved one. Any 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 thoughts on that? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> Well, I think on that note, too, that often we're uncertain of things, and sharing that uncertainty in these settings is actually quite helpful, saying, you know, this is a difficult situation. I, I myself am not sure the exact best way, so let's hear the different perspectives and try to work with them, as opposed to that kind of, you know, a little bit more black and white approach that we, we might sometimes take. And I think really understanding the, the uh, you know, when I turned 40 quite a few years ago, the first person I saw after turning 40 was a, was a lady who had widely metastatic disease that wanted to be full code, and it caused all sorts of kerfuffles. Well, she's got widespread cancer. And it turned out that she really felt that she had had, had re radiotherapy recently that she thought was curative, but was actually palliative. And so we talked a little bit what that goal of treatment had been. And also, she was very concerned that if she said she was no CPR, that nothing else would be done, and she'd not get all of her other needs met. And so we reassured her about a, the goals, and reassured her about what we would be doing as opposed to what we wouldn't be doing, and she transitioned towards having a bigger focus on symptom management, which is really where the team wanted her to be, so. Great, well, thank you very much for your interest. And I'm not as good as Dr. Wong at all these photo things, so. Um, yeah, let's thank um, Dr. Frank. Um, he is actually a past CGS president, and he also has experience with care of the elderly. So if anyone, I guess, have questions, maybe they can, they can ask you at some time today. Yeah. Okay, so um, why don't we take um, like a two-minute break for like washroom break or like quick drink or get coffee or whatever. Um, and then afterwards, we're going to have our workshops. So I can see that there's um, some people that have less people in their table than others. So maybe 